Are you good? Uh, okay. Let's uh, see what... Did anybody have any specific questions before I go back to this list? Yeah? Um, is it possible if we can go over our dissertation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me add that to the list. That's definitely on the exam. Uh, anything else that I should add to the list for today? Wow, it's dead in here. Like half the class. That's okay. You should rewrite all your notes in yellow ones. <laughs> just scan those. In. They probably actually wouldn't look that bad after I scanned them. It'd be worse for you guys. Um, all right. So, any particular topic you want me to cover first on here? Most of this is AC stuff and then power dissipation, so maybe I just go power dissipation and then go into AC stuff. Yeah, those are, I mean, that. yeah, I'll, I'll go over that too. I want to go over that actually first and then I'll do power dissipation and then I'll go AC. Um, okay, so let's go to a new sheet. Uh, the first thing I should say and uh, everyone should maybe remember is that the only components that dissipate power are resistors in, in terms of what we know so far. Capacitors and inductors ideally don't dissipate power, they store energy, right? Power being the dissipation of energy over time. The capacitors and inductors ideally don't dissipate any. In real life, Capacitors and inductors have equivalent series resistance, which it, it, that's where the power gets dissipated. Um, but in terms of academically and what we're doing, uh, the capacitors and inductors are assumed to be ideal, so they don't dissipate any power. So I guess I'll talk about power dissipation first since I already started. It's real, uh, it's actually real brief. Um, basically, if we're looking at a resistor, we know that that resistor has some voltage across it and some current flowing through it, right? And some resistance R. I'll write that in green. All right. Well, the power dissipated by this resistor is equal to uh, the voltage across it multiplied by the current through it, and the unit is watts. Uh, again, that's a measure of how much energy is being dissipated over a span of time. Uh, so watts is equivalent to joules per second energy per time. Uh, we just take the, it's basically like a, a instantaneous measure of how much energy is being dissipated per time. It's like if you look at a car and you say it's traveling 50 miles per hour, uh, miles per hour is a unit for how fast it's traveling right now. It might not be going 50 miles an hour for the next hour, but at this moment it's going 50 miles per hour. That's the speed. So we can think of like at any given time, it might be 10 joules per, per second or 10 millijoules per second. That's what watts is. It's how many joules per second are we dissipating right now. Um, and then we can use Ohm's law to rearrange this equation uh, I think I wrote these during class when we did this. Uh, v is equal to I times R. So using Ohm's law, we can... Because if, right, if we were going to find V times I and we only knew V and R, right, we would have to find I by V over R. So we can rewrite this equation in that case for V times V over R or V squared over R. And that's also power. Um, there's all those different combinations for how to find power. The most common one that we all remember is just IV because uh, it's, it's just the easiest. Uh, any questions about that? Yeah. When you say uh, voltage uh, across the resistor, you mean like the drop across it? Yeah, so if this was 10 and this was 6, V is 4. Or if this was 10 and this was 0, then this is 10. Right. Anything else? Good? Uh, all right, so now let me go to that other topic, which is capacitors and inductors in, in DC. 
feel free to, if you have a question about this later, we can come back and there's some room here. Yeah. The last problem from the midterm. Let's go look. Yeah, let me do it real quick. Um, let me just draw it. Alright, so first, uh, my current flowing in this loop is 1 milliamp, right? So right off the bat, I know I have 1K, 2K, 3K in series, which gives me a total of 6K. And uh, then to find VS, I just multiply that 6K times my 1 milliamp. Alright. Uh, VW, I have 3K in series. Um, 3K times 1 milliamp gives me 3 volts. And then VX, I have 1K times 1 milliamp, which gives me 1 volt. Alright, so now I'm looking at the difference. Oh, I didn't write the gain of this thing. It's 1 milli. All right, so I'm taking that voltage input, uh, the difference, which this is three volts and this is one volt, and I'm multiplying it by the gain, which is one milli. So I'm taking two volt difference times one milli gain, which gives me two milliamp current source. So my current in this loop is going to be two milliamps. All right, I'm dropping uh, two milliamps times one k across this one k resistor. Yeah. Sorry, why did you? So the difference of the two inputs right here, I've got three volts and one volt. That difference is what goes into the current source. Okay, so if we go back to the picture, the plus terminal and the minus terminal right on the current source, uh, this voltage right here is three volts and this voltage right here is one volt. So that difference is two, okay? And then my gain is one milli. So two times one milli gives me two milliamps for that current source. Yeah. Is it going to be the same when it's a voltage source? Or is it different? It's the same thing, it just depends on the gain. If the gain, the gain for a voltage source might be a thousand because I'm taking a current and multiplying it up to a voltage. But one way or another, all you're doing is taking that difference and multiplying it by this number. And this is just 10 to the minus three. All right, so two milliamps times one K, two volts. We know this is ground, so that's zero. We drop two, this gives me negative two volts. And then over here, my current's flowing down through that 1K, so that would be VZ would give me positive two volts. Any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Wait, sir, how did you get VS? Uh, 3K plus 2K plus 1K in series gives me 6k and I multiply by my current to get 6 volts. It's basically this that I'm looking at. 3k, 2k, 1k, that's 6k and my current is 1 milliamp so my voltage drop from VS to ground is Six, 6 times 1 milliamp, 6k times 1 milliamp. 
All right. All right, now I'm going to go on to capacitors and inductors in DC. Uh, let me. Oh, did I not do the dissipation part? Is that part of it too? I guess I didn't do it. Uh, do R4 and R5 is paid the same amount of power? Okay. So R, f I don't even know which ones those are. Uh, the, these two. All right. So they're the same resistance values, so you may be inclined to think that they dissipate the same amount of power. However, the, the voltage across R4 is VZ, which is 2 volts, right? And the current through R4 is equal to 2 milliamps. So if I take these two and multiply them, that gives me 4 milliwatts, right, for uh, R4. R5 has 1 milliamp flowing through it and 1 volt across it. So that's only equal to 1 milliwatt. So no, they don't dissipate the same amount of power. All right. All right, now I'm done with this. Okay. All right, so in DC, right, a capacitor is an open and an inductor is a short. What I mean by that is literally exactly what I wrote. So let's say I were to give you some DC circuit, right? My source is DC and I put an inductor and then let's say I put a capacitor right here. And let's say I told you to find V out. Does anybody know V out off the top of your head? Anybody confused about that? <laughs> Are you? Are you actually? No. <laughs> it's a one milli Henry re resistor. <laughs> Hanks? Micro Hanks? Inductors are now squiggly resistors. Yeah. It look, it's supposed to look like a coil, I guess. You guys are insane. Some people draw them like this, like more like a spring. I don't know. I, I don't think that's good. This is what they're supposed to look like. I mean, this is kind of cool because it looks like a coil, but you get people who can't draw and then <laughs> it just looks like crap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Could you imagine? Like, no, I have video proof that it wasn't. <laughs> That's true. Does everybody see that this, these two equivalent, these circuits are equivalent? Yeah. All right. Uh, that's what I mean when I say that they're a short and an open in DC. If someone gives you a DC circuit, but then again, it could be an RC circuit or an RL circuit where it's just been sitting there for a really long time, right? Like if I pulse from zero up to five, obviously there's going to be some weird behavior in here because of the inductors and the capacitors. But after it's been sitting there for a long time, that's basically a DC circuit. Once all of the 
uh, weird stuff has happened where the capacitors and inductors charge. Once nothing else is changing, uh, it's a DC circuit. So you're, you're pro but my, the point being that you're never going to see a circuit in real life that just looks like this, where it's a battery. There's no reason to have the inductor or the capacitor there. They're not doing anything. But you might see, you know, something that goes zero up to five, and then it does some weird stuff. And then once it's sitting at five for a really long time, the out's going to be 2.5, no matter what happened prior. All right. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Well, all it is is a wire. Yeah. Like a real inductor is just literally a wire like this wrapped in a coil around a magnet. There's a magnet in the middle. But it, it, the magnet only does anything interesting, right? So we talked about this. The voltage across an inductor is equal to L times the rate of change of the current, right? Well, if the current's not changing... DC, then there is no voltage across the inductor, and that's a short. It's just a wire, right? But with the, uh, the capacitor, um, capacitor has a physical gap, yeah. which is why when there's nothing, when there's only DC nothing interesting happens, it's an open. It, it's physically, these two conductive plates are physically separated by some non-conductive material, right? And again, in this case, the current of the capacitor is C times the rate of change of the voltage. If the voltage isn't changing, DC, the current is zero, which is an open. That makes sense? So mathematically, that's what's happening. Physically, this is a wire when there's, you know, nothing interesting happening. The magnet's not doing anything. And this is literally an open, a gap between two plates. They, they only have interesting properties when the current is changing for an inductor or when the voltage is changing for a capacitor. All right? Any questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Right. And the, but the inductor acting like an open would probably cause some other weird crap to happen. That's why I didn't give you any LC circuits. LC circuits have these weird properties. Um, they have a specific frequency at which they oscillate. Uh, I think it's 1 over root LC. Like if you throw an LC circuit into a, like LT spice, you'll see that like you send it a pulse and then it'll like wiggle until it dissipates. But they like dump the energy back and forth between them. I don't know enough about it to teach about it. That's why I didn't. I haven't done anything with them. So, but, but yeah. If this was just like an an L R R, and you pulse it up to five, right? It would act as if you know the inductor will will charge. So, so say we we looked at this circuit without a capacitor in it, right? And we've got this initially at zero. Everything's initially at zero. When this jumps up to five, right? The current in the inductor can't start flowing immediately. So Vx would go up to 5, and Vout would go up to 5. Or, sorry. No, that wouldn't make sense either, because then there'd be current flowing. I think initially everything would stay at 0, and there'd be 5 volts across the inductor, right? And then this Vx would eventually charge up to 5, and this Vo would eventually charge up to 2.5. And then when it's sitting there, right, that's a wire, that's 5, that's 5, that's 2.5. That makes sense? Yeah? I mean, we could throw it in spice if you want to see. I don't know what's going to happen because of the LC. Because the X is zero, the charge across it would just stay at zero. <laughs> the last time you installed your LT spice update was 46 days ago. No. They love that. I, I, I like that it doesn't tell me until it's been 46 days. I've it's not accurate. It's always 46 days. It's, it's not accurate because the day I downloaded it, it was like, your LT spice has been updated in 180. Unless they, it's been 186 days since their last, up, like forced update, yeah, yeah. 
but I don't understand. I think they're just bad. At Why doesn't it say it's been two days since you last updated? Like, well, maybe they have an update every 46 days or something. I don't know. Ask Dr. Baker, doesn't he know the guy? He does know the guy. Let's ask him. <laughs> well, maybe he really does. Let's maybe. mess with people and not make it 30. I know. Let's go 46. What did I say? One milli Henry? Can somebody do one over root LC for me in your calculator so we can determine what that frequency might be if there's oscillations? 1 over root L, root of L times C. L times C? L being 1 milli Henry. Who said a milli amp? <laughs> I heard amp. Someone said amp. Harold. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, so in DC, let's just run this so you can see, right? It basically behaves exactly like a voltage divider, right? The, the, the inductors are short, so the Vs and Vx are exactly the same, and then Vout is 2.5. But if we do a pulse, it's going gonna, it's gonna to definitely behave weird. Uh, did anybody find it, the frequency? Uh, 31,600K. 31, okay. Let's see. All right, I guess I'll just calculate it. It's 10 to the minus 9 on the bottom. So L times C is 1 times 1 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the minus 3. That's just 10 to the minus 9. And then root of 10 to the minus 9. And then invert. 31.6K, and then the period being 31.6 microseconds. Okay. Let's turn this into a pulse. We'll go 0 to 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, one pico, one pico. That's ah, fine. Ugh. All right. Let's see what happens. Oscillations. Oh, I didn't give it any on time. Sorry. Well, that might be better to see the, the oscillations. Uh. Yeah, no, let me go back and give this an on time. I basically have the input spiking to five for like absolutely no time at all and coming right back down. So let's leave it on for like a second. So you see it, you see it oscillating, but it's getting these huge voltages. Like why the heck is it going all the way up to 10 volts? That's, that's why I don't get into LC stuff because weird stuff happens and I don't know why, so I don't wanna. You probably won't get into LC oscillations, and you'll get into circuits that have inductors and capacitors in them together, but it's just going to be like what I showed you with right. like a phaser, and they're, you're treating them as impedances. I don't know that you ever really get into LC oscillations and stuff unless you take like advanced electromagnetics, and I didn't, so that's why I don't know it. <laughs> but if we run this for like a really long time, let's say like maybe five milliseconds, you'll see these start to like settle to some value. So what's happening is the blue is settling towards 5, right? It's going to settle to 5. And the black is settling to 2.5. So after a really long time, let's go like 500, it might actually get there. Yeah, see? So these crazy oscillations happen at the beginning. And then they settle to the values, like I said, they would in DC once it's sitting at 5. and these Because these oscillations ideally would go on forever, but energy is dissipated by the 
capacitors. That's basically like the sloshing of like energy back and forth in the circuit until it's all dissipated. That excess energy from the pulse. But yeah, you don't need to know any of this. And that just happens for like a few microseconds. Theoretically though, that that frequency should be what I said it was, and I don't know that it is. It might be one over root two pi L C. Like that that uh omega might be it might be Omega equals one over. That's what it is. Omega is equal to one over root LC. This is incredibly unimportant for you guys. So let's not. Let's get out of here. If you're if you're curious, Omega is equal to one over root LC. So if you want to find the frequency of the oscillations, you would do one over two pi times root LC. Right. One sec. Okay, just in case you ever uh, need to know that, you're going to be like, oh yeah, I remember that one lecture where he was supposed to be reviewing and was talking about other crap. Let me theoretically, you could make an AC, like, voltage source that you could use. And inductor and a capacitor? You could, but the second you pulled current from it, it would go away. So and like, constantly pulse it. see that's something I thought about when I was in 220. I was like, I can make a power supply with like variable voltages just by using a bunch of resistors. But as soon as you connect it to something, that voltage gets destroyed because now you're pulling current away. That's why you need regulators. That's why you need op amps. That's why you need these other things that can actually send current and not change voltage. Because if you just use a voltage divider, right? Let's say I wanted to create a a five volt generator and all I have is a 10 volt uh, battery. I don't know. And I'm like, oh, I could just, you know, 1K, 1K that, and now I have a 5 volt supply. The second you connect that to something, that 5 volts is going to get yanked down because now you're adding more resistance or the current that was flowing here, which was what's 10 volt over 2K, 5 milliamps. Part of it's going this way because of KCL. So that, that voltage changes completely. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so. You need something that can basically supply current without changing voltage, and some random node with a resistor is not it. So how do you supply current to something without changing voltage? You need amplifiers that can like maintain, they have like feedback. Uh, you have all these switching power supplies that, basically there's these switching power supplies that you're, if you ever take 421 with Baker, hopefully you get the chance to, you'll design one. Um, it's a feedback system that basically has an inductor and a capacitor on the output and when the it's it's when the voltage on the output say you want it to be 5 volts if it gets a little bit above 5 volts it triggers some switch inside of the feedback system to pull that node down start pulling it down and it'll start pulling it down until it gets a little bit below 5 volts and then it'll trigger a different switch to pull the node back up and so the the node is basically wiggling forever at 5 volts but you can pull current from it because it's, it's designed to, to switch back and forth around 5 volts really, really finely, no matter what's happening on the output. And those are called switching power supplies, and they're really useful. If you ever heard of it, someone will, at some point, if you hear about it in senior design, you'll need a power supply. There's buck switching power supplies. There's boost switching power supplies. There's flyback power supplies. All these are like full-blown systems designed to keep the voltage at the output constant while you pull current from it. So it's so like you a, just have to constantly switch everything based on what's happening in the rest of the circuit. Well, that's one possible way to do it. There's also linear regulators that don't use any switching at all. Uh, when you do 221 and the 221 lab, you'll use re linear regulators. They get really, really hot because they're burning power inside, trying to keep the voltage at whatever you're asking for while you're pulling current from it. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of different power supplies. Power supply design is a whole field. So like designing something to say a fixed voltage while you're pulling current from it is like a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's not something that could be simply explained. It, it takes a whole system. And a lot of components that we haven't even discussed yet that you'll you'll learn about in 221 and 320. The only thing I'm imagining is just a little voltage dude. He's just sitting there. He's like, I'm going to go up a bit, and then there's a stick to hit. He's like, I'm going to go down a bit, and there's a stick to hit. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a pretty good analogy for how it works. 
so you imagine a power supply as like some elf in a box that yeah, is just constantly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you guys ever seen that like Ohm's Law like yeah, graphic? Ohm's Law dudes, yeah. Ohm's Law graphic. Uh, it's like a little like cartoon. Yeah, these ones. The currents, just like the, this is like an okay like picture of what happens. I mean, the voltage is literally what's pu pushing the current, right? It's pushing the electrons through. Amps is a measure of how much charge is going through a particular area per time. So you can think of it as like that's what's actually moving is the current. It's it's electrons, and then ohms is like stop. When, I want to stop it from moving. So like if it lets off a little bit, there will be more space for it to go through. And there's all these really good videos on YouTube for this stuff too. Like people use Blender, which is like a 3D software to make really good animations for current and voltage and all kinds of interesting stuff. There's one on LC oscillations if you're super interested. Um, all right, so we've got about 40 something more minutes. Let's that see what. The second one right there is a little off. This one? Fox and bunnies. <laughs> it's like that's the mother trying to get their children out so that they don't suffocate, and the fox is like fucking kids. Jeez, a little. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to have to censor this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's all good. <laughs> that is pretty weird. Somebody who's not going to be uh, in here and watch it later to see a random air horn. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that fox and bunny thing. That's kind of creepy. Or, or just just a gap in the audio where it gets quiet for a solid thirty seconds. <laughs> just completely cut it out. <laughs> okay, AC signals, AC steady state. Does, does everybody want me to go over some of those like RLC, RC, RL circuits in the AC? Yeah? <laughs> oh, I did, you're right. RLC, RC, RL, in AC. I was listing all the types and then in AC. That was a lot, you're right. All right, so I'll do that. Just do, maybe I'll just brush over it again. Uh, okay, so let's just say AC. AC steady state and DC steady state are two very different things. Uh, DC steady state is when nothing in the circuit's changing at all. AC steady state is when the input is the only thing that's changing, right? Because we, we have an input that's a sine wave, right? The voltage is constantly changing. Um, but if nothing else is changing in the circuit, like we're not sitting there... Uh, Basically, when we did RC circuits and RL circuits for the first time, that's called step response. Like, we're going to take the voltage and step it up to a new value and see how it responds. That's, that's called step response. Steady state is when the input is like a fixed AC signal. Like, it's, it's oscillating, but like it's controlled, right? It's not going sharply from zero to one. It's constantly switching back and forth between two states or whatever. All right. Uh, that's just what they call it. I don't know. All this is is I have an AC source, basically doing something interesting with some impedance. Uh, all right, well, let's say I do, I don't know, I've kind of done all of these. Any particular order? I just do like a L and then an R. That was what was on the quiz, so. No, it doesn't matter. Let's just say L is equal to 10 millihenries and R is equal to 10K. And we'll make this 12. Here, I'll write all the different things that we could have here, right? You could see 12 angle zero, right? That would mean, it, since we're talking in terms of cosine in this class, 12 cosine 2 pi FT plus zero basically, but I'm not gonna write it. Right, that's that's like V in of T. That's my function for V, V in, right? And so, I don't know, let's pick a frequency. Let's, let me go pick a frequency that's gonna be interesting. 
I did this last time. I'm just going to do it real quick. I just don't want to pick some crappy values like I always do. 10 milli Henry's, 10k. Out. AC1. Uh, okay, a good value will be something out here. The reason I'm saying this is because if I pick any frequency down here, 1, 10, 100, 1K, 10K, my input and my output are going to be equal, and then that's no fun. So let's pick something over here. Uh, let's just go with 200K. All right. Again, that doesn't matter for my phaser. If I wanted to write my total impedance, Z total, it's equal to basically the impedance of my resistor plus the impedance of my inductor, right? And my impedance of my inductor is what? Omega. What's omega? What's F? Yeah, yeah. Well, what is it in this case? All right. And then L is uh, 10 milli Henry's. So therefore, my ZL is 10 milli times 2 pi times 200 K times J. Where this part right here is omega, and this part right here is L, and that's my J. Any questions about that? 2 pi times 200,000 times 10 times 10 to the minus 3, 12.56, 12.57K. All right. J, 12.57K. What's the impedance of my resistor? What? All right. I talked about this in my office today, uh, but I'm going to talk about it now here because I, I think you should know it. It's not anything new. It's just something I never talked about that you may or may not have noticed by now. Anytime I have a resistor, so let's say I have a resistor, its phasor is equal to the resistance angle zero, right? Just that one resistor, because it doesn't have an imaginary part. So when I take the, you do that every time, and it gets me, it throws me off. Um, I when I take the tan inverse, right, of imaginary over real, there is no imaginary part, so it's zero over something. And when I put that in my calculator, I get zero. So that's my phase. And when I take the magnitude. Say that's equal to the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared, but the imaginary part is zero for a resistor, so it's just zero. Which that's just comes out to be the square root of x squared, which is just x. So if it was just my R, right, that's that's for every resistor ever. So when you get to the point where you're like, oh I need the phaser for this resistor, it's R angle zero. It's never gonna be you don't have to do these equations every time. I mean you can and they're gonna work, but you should eventually get to the point where you're like, okay, a resistor is just the resistance angle zero. For an inductor, it's going to be omega L angle 90. And for a capacitor, it's going to be 1 over omega C angle minus 90. All right? every time. And the same proofs can be done here if you wanted me to do them real quick. 
the magnitude of ZL is going to be 0 plus the imaginary part squared, square rooted, right, which just gives me the imaginary part, which is just omega L, right? The J is not the imaginary part. Uh, let me make that clear. Uh, when I say that this is J omega L, or if I say anything, like this, this resistance total was 10K plus J omega L. The real part is the 10K, and the imaginary part is the omega L. The J is just multiplied by the imaginary part. J is not part of the imaginary part. It indicates what is the imaginary part. So in a normal complex number, they say X plus J Y. Y is the imaginary part. J Y is not the imaginary part. Does that make sense? It's real plus J times imaginary. So this little piece here is the imaginary part. All right. So that would just give me Y. And then again, phase would be tan inverse of some positive value, uh, omega L, I guess, or yeah, over zero, something over zero which gives me just 90 degrees. Remember we showed that plot of 10 inverse. And the capacitor is the same way, except it's a minus y over 0, which gives me a negative 90. All right. So now that we know all that, uh, let's put these into phasers. So ZL, well, I guess we don't need to do that yet. We're trying to find current. We want our whole, our whole thing to be, so Z total is 10K plus J 12.57K. I want to find the magnitude of the total. It's going to be 10k squared plus 12.57k squared, square root, 16.06k. And then the phase of the total is the tan inverse of 12.57k over 10k, right? My imaginary part over my real part. That's going to be fifty-one point five. So therefore, ZT is equal to sixteen point oh six. Angle 51.5 kilo ohms. Any questions about finding the total impedance? Good. And now if I want to find the current, I can do the voltage, input voltage divided by the total impedance. I is equal to 12 angle 0 divided by 16.06 K angle 51.5 that's equal to what's 12 divided by 16 K gives me 0 0.75 basically milliamps angle negative 51.5 How did I get negative 51.5? I got 0 minus 51.5 because when we divide phasers, we just subtract the angles, right? And again, you could write the milli here and then the amps out here. You could write the whole unit out here. It doesn't matter as long as you know what the unit is and you write what the unit is. So if I wanted to find V out, uh, my load being a resistor, I would multiply I times R and I get V out. I have my phaser for R, right? It's just 10K angle zero. And my I is 0.75 milli angle negative 51.5. So I would multiply the 10K by the 0.75 milli. I would go zero plus negative 51.5 and I'd get negative 51.5. It makes sense that my current and my V out would be in phase because my resistor is my load, right? It's, it doesn't have a phase, so it's not gonna contribute. Any questions? All right, we've got 30 minutes. Does anybody have any questions in sp specific? Do you want me to solve random problems? James? Yeah. Why does the survey, like the end of class survey say, select your instructor and uh, Mr. Baker, Dr. Baker? It says Baker? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Is it an option for you? Is it, it's because Baker is technically the teacher for the 
For the discussion, yeah. yeah. Baker's technically the instructor for the discussion, but. I mean, I could have been. discussion never showed up in class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a rate of that. Really? That'd be funny. I just put not applicable on the answer to every question for the discussion section. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, there was a discussion. Was there? I mean, if you watched any of the other videos. It could have been a discussion, but nobody ever answered anything until you did. <laughs> I mean, I answered some stuff, but then I got swamped. Thanks for picking up my slack. Yeah, that's half the class. Yeah, literally. How many announcements did I send in there? Basically, everybody that showed up to class, like, was the last thing of the week before, they like, oh, bus is canceled? Yeah, yeah those people didn't know. Twice. Those people didn't know that there was a Google group. That was actually me. I didn't check I that. I didn't check that. <laughs> I looked at the Google group every day except for the two days before the class. 56.8. Nice. So, We're climbing. My emails are, are, are getting to some people. Harris is offering an extra credit. I don't know how to view them. I would. <laughs> I wouldn't even care. I don't think you can view them until after the semester. Yeah, because I, I could be like, how like, dare you students? I'm going to fail all of you. <laughs> Because somebody doesn't like me, could you imagine? That would be horrible, but I could see somebody doing that. There, there's like, got to be some professor somewhere that would, would do oh, just wait, that. In progress, or I don't know what they're doing right now. Someone's doing it right now? No, Who's doing it right now? A, there is an in progress bar. Oh, oh. Are you going to whip it out and see? <laughs> Here, I'll minimize it. You can go ahead and do that. And then we'll come back to it. Uh, all right, what, what should I do for 30 minutes? Uh, figure out how it no. <laughs> I, I actually looked it up. I looked it up, and half the terms they were using, I didn't understand. Yeah, it's all it's all stuff that. It was like magic. Thus, the derivation of Ohm's law is done. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't they just appeared out of thin air. Well, they they. <laughs> well, they derived it from this linear plot, which, like, sure, you could do that, but like, that's not how you derive Ohm's law. That's like. That's like doing an experiment and then looking at the results and going, oh, Ohm's law. The question is, where did it come from? Yeah. Yeah, look, this guy's using drift velocity. See, that's the kind of stuff you need to look at. That's all stuff from 330. Drift velocity. You guys learned about that in Physics 181? Yeah. yeah. That's like how fast the electrons are like moving, actually moving yeah. through, yeah, right? Really Super slow. It's like a millimeter per second. Yeah, it's so weird. You think that they're just flying through the wire, but they're actually like flying back and forth and moving along at like a ridiculous snail's pace. I don't know. It's so weird. I don't know how they observe this stuff. Crazy. Yeah. All right, well, let's see. Is there anything else I could review that would be useful? You had a question, that's right. Um, and the problem we solved for like a time constant, usually it's like milliseconds or microseconds, but uh, in your experience, have you made stuff where the time constant is like seconds long? Yeah, so actually, if you go to, when you take the 221 lab, here, let's go. They did that in the physics lab for capacitors. They gave us a super long time constant so that we could like observe it happening. Minutes? No, it was like ten seconds. Oh yeah, you can you can get it to work. Like it will work. I, I it's not common because. Yeah, because it was in the physics lab. It was for us. It was fifteen. For him, it was twenty. Minutes. We waited twenty minutes for one of them to fully disappear. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The time really constant. The time constant was like ten or fifteen seconds. You had to sit there for ten minutes. Jeez, Lou. That's ridiculous. That's just a waste of time. Uh, this circuit right here, uh, I think it's the frequency response circuit. They make you do a 555 timer circuit, uh, and they have you set the RC to like 10 seconds or something. Let me see. Yeah, they said set the time for 10 seconds, uh, which is like, the, that's the longest I've ever seen. I mean, it does it like this whole lab. What you do is you set the output of the RC to like you send it to an LED, or the output of this chip, and uh, it basically triggers when the RC charges, and then it'll discharge. And after it's 
10 second time or whatever, then it shuts itself off. So you, you connect it to an LED and you can like view that the LED's on for 10 seconds and then it shuts off. But usually time constants are pretty small. Oh, okay. Like milli and microseconds like I showed. Because all, the, the use for a lot of this stuff is inside chips that are processing thousands if not millions of instructions per second. Yeah. And so anything that is using an RC to do any timing is in like the microseconds or nanosecond range. But like, it can be done. I mean, it, I did it on the breadboard with these kids that were in my tutoring, and it, it did take 10 seconds. So, so yeah. I mean, I know that there's some like RCs out in the power grid that can take like days to discharge because the capacitors are so huge. Uh, that's kind of scary. Like my uncle got shocked by a capacitor that wasn't fully discharged because the time constant was like two days, and he only waited like a day before he went back or something. Nuts. Is he still alive? Yeah, he's fine. He works for the uh, Envy Energy. So the fact that he just taught me how to go through a substation on that bag. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ryan took his substation training class. Is it a class? Uh, it's a, it's a little, like, two-hour, long, just instructional. Hey, this is how you not don't die. He's the one that told me about the guy who cut the copper and zapped himself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any good wisdom I could give you guys. Life to What's up? Can you give us a really brief overview of like, everything in 221? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can. I'll just go look at the book. Life <laughs> and then, <laughs> all right, let's, uh... How did you become a Chad? Nope. <laughs> I don't know how to become a Chad. <laughs> Me? Okay, what does that mean then? I thought it was a bad thing. No. Oh, what? No. It's a good thing. Wait, is it, is it not a bad thing? No. I've only ever heard it in a negative light. Really? I think it has kind of a new meaning. I thought that was like the male equivalent of a Karen. Yeah. No, 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 that's a Karen. Yeah. That's a Karen. That's like, you get all the women, you're buff as hell. It's kind of like a version of the gentleman. Oh my gosh, you guys are insane. The American version of the British is that the gentleman. Oh, I guess I gotta open the actual book. <laughs> you guys are so. <laughs> Well, it's in the right folder, so. <laughs> if it was in the wrong folder, I would have no idea. <laughs> no, I have a whole folder of textbooks. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is what you go over in that class. Uh, well, let's just go to the, the table of contents. That'd probably be better. So you start here at this AC circuits. So the first thing you do is sinusoids and phasers. We've already done that, so you'll know all that. That should be really easy. Uh, I introduced sinusoids. I introduced phasers. So just so you know, anything that's got this sinusoidal nature is a sinusoid. Even if it's a cosine wave, they'll still call it a sinusoid. They won't. They will not call it a cosinusoid. I thought that too. I was like, "What's a cosine wave called?" It's still a sinusoid. We're gonna change that. Cosine wave. No. You can't. You can't do this with whoever teaches you 221. They're not gonna think it's funny. Uh, I just don't think. I mean, if it's Dr. Sabrina, yeah, he, he's not gonna think it's funny. He's nice. I mean, he's a cool guy. I just don't think he'll. Appreciate the humor. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yeah, you guys gotta find a way to make it fun. Uh, so phasers, we already went over phasor relationships for circuit elements. That's literally what I just did when I showed this. Uh, where are we? This stuff. This is. Uh, impedance and admittance. I think admit admittance is the opposite of impedance. It's like conductance and resistance. Like, am I admitting the electrons to flow, or am I impeding the electrons from flowing? So 
<laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe. Like in a conductor? I've just never heard of them. I've just never heard of them. Maybe. Kirchhoff's laws in the frequency domain. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I didn't cover that, but it's just, it's if we were to solve these circuits using KVL and KCL, like if I were to do a two-loop circuit, it would still hold, all these laws hold, right? You can still do a KVL around the circuit. You can still do KCL at any node. You just have to keep in mind that their voltages and currents are phasers. They have a magnitude and a phase. Um, impedance combinations, that's just adding, you know, inductors and capacitors impedances like we've been doing. So chapter nine we basically covered. Chapter 10 I covered one like single loop circuits but I haven't done any two loop circuits. So they do nodal mesh, like all the same stuff we did in DC but now with these phasers. I just didn't get into all of it. Uh, superposition, source transformation, feminine ignoring, literally everything that you already love, know and love. Uh, in AC. But in AC. I think I was probably supposed to cover op amps, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I don't like op amps. I don't think you'll like op amps. Uh, it wouldn't have made much of a difference if I would have covered them. There, it's basically just an amplifier that takes in two inputs and amplifies the difference between them. That's that's what an op amp is. Huh? Yeah, the controlled source is like a model of an op amp. Like if you if you look at like what Baker's like op amp model is when he teaches it, it's basically a D, it's a voltage controlled voltage source with a humongous gain, and then there's feedback, uh, and it basically you can you can put some resistors in there. Uh, here, let me just show you. Oh, that would be a good thing to talk about. So this would be like a model of like what an op amp would do. And so you got, let's say, this is your output. And this is why I didn't teach them, because they don't, comp they don't entirely make sense to me. But this gain is some enormous number, like 10 to the 22 or something huge, for an ideal op amp. Real op amps are like in the millions or hundreds of thousands. And you'll see, I'll show you that it, it'll get less ideal. Uh, but basically, there's a ratio of resistors that you connect from the output back to the inputs, and that ratio sets the gain, the actual gain. So this this gain right here is called the open loop gain. That's the gain if there were no feedback. So if I were to put a difference of one volt in here right now, ideally it would output a value of that's a million, million, million times bigger. Like this number is absolutely ridiculous. Then closed loop gain is the gain that you physically set with that ratio of resistors. And so let me show you. Let me actually, I think there's another, yeah, this is the one I want. I want to flip the inputs. You see how the inputs are flipped? There's a minus plus. You typically send the feedback to the minus terminal in an op amp because uh, you need what's called negative feedback. Have you ever heard of positive feedback? Where like in a room where the mic like and it just like ex blows your ears out. You don't want positive feedback in a circuit any more than you want positive feedback in audio. Stuff will like blow up. So you need negative feedback. So if I were to, I'll call this V out. And then uh, I'll take my input and I'll pass it into the plus terminal. And then my minus term. Uh, I'm gonna have to mess around with this. We'll see what happens. I think you have to go here and then here. This ratio is what matters. It's the ratio between the two resistors. And you're feeding that back to the input. Uh, okay. And let's just put this at ground. So this is what's called the inverting topology. When you pass your, you connect your input to the minus terminal. They call the minus terminal the inverting terminal and the plus terminal the non-inverting terminal. And I'll just show you how this works. Let's make this two volts. I'll make this one K and I'll make this one K. 
and then I will run a dot op. Oh, what happened? I thought I had. Thanks. So v out is negative two. Okay. So the ratio is one. This is an inverting topology, so it takes an input of two and turns it into an output of negative two. This ratio here, that we usually call this R2 and this R1, or you can call it R final and R initial, I don't know. But what happens is, uh, let's say I, my, my gain is negative R2 over R1. So if I set this to 7K, now I have a gain of minus seven, right? The ratio of these resistors is all that matters. So if I go here, now my V out is negative 14 volts. You see that? So this is called a non-inverting op amp. You won't see it look like this though. You'll see it look like this. <coughs> Baker has a lot of lectures on op amps, so you can always look back at his lectures. I should have covered them, but I ran out of time and I felt like the AC stuff is harder. His lectures on op amps are much better than mine would have been. Uh, this is what the op amp will look like when you see it. Is your course web page going to stay up after yeah. this semester? Yeah, it should. If Even if he tries to take it down, I found a way to access them. So uh, I can always send it to you, like the link to you if you ever, if you ever need it. It's, it's going to be the same link. It'll be like... Like if you won't, you might not be able to find my student page and then click on the link there, but the link to the web page, like, oh my God, so I had so many stuff. So many uh, this link will still be there because he won't delete it. He'll just hide it so you can't access it. But if you go type this exact link into your, uh, you know, browser, you'll find the page. So it shouldn't be, it shouldn't go away. And even if it does go away, I'm probably gonna, I mean, I still own all the videos on my drive or whatever. And when I have my webpage at Stanford, I'll just post, here's when I taught EE220 and then the webpage will be there somewhere. Yeah. I'll just have to find a way to get it to everybody. And know your other customers were saying. <laughs> 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 it is what it is. <laughs> spicy KBL. Uh, I'll post it on my LinkedIn or something. I'm sure most of you have LinkedIn. Some poor student from another university just finds it on Google somewhere and is wondering what we're talking about. Yeah, they probably will. That comes up in an interview. So, we were doing a background check and... <laughs> 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 All right, so this is what the op amp will look like when you see it. Um, there's something practical I want to talk to you about with op amps. Okay, so you see over here, uh, we have, we're putting in two volts and I'm getting out like negative 14 here, right? Well, a real op amp, this is not a real op amp, this is an ideal op amp. And even then when you do, like if you go type op, you can find op amps in here. They have power supply rails, okay? They have a plus and a minus. This is called an active circuit. Everything we've used up to this point was a passive. Passive components don't require power to operate, right? If I just use a resistor, see, it's kind of touchy because I say they don't require power to operate, but if you don't put a voltage into it, it's not going to do anything. But it doesn't need you to apply some external voltage in order for it to do what it's going to do. A resistor is going to resist the flow of electrons without something externally powering it, okay? An op amp is not going to do anything unless you power it, okay? And what you power it with determines how high or how low the voltages can be. I think I talked about this maybe a long time ago, but what I mean by that is here, let's say I was using this op amp, this op amp actually, this, this non-ideal op amp, and let's say I was powering it with uh, plus or minus five volts. So I've got five volts on the plus terminal and negative five on the minus for my supply. If I put in two volts, I'm not going to get negative 14 volts out. I can't. I can only get within those power supply rails, okay? Those what I'm supplying it with, those are called your supply rails, okay? And you, this is gonna be really practical because when you get into the lab and there's all these clowns plugging in their op amps expecting to get a million volts out because they set their gain to a million, and they're like, why is it only two volts? Like, it's because you're only powering at two volts. You cannot get more than what you power it with, all right? And when you go to an op amp data sheet, you're gonna learn about data sheets. Let's look up like the LM741. So data sheets are really important. They basically tell you everything you need to know about a device. 
it'll tell you what the maximum voltage, uh, power supply voltage is that you can put. Uh, let's see, is this a data sheet? Yeah, this is a data sheet. It'll tell you, so this is like the typical configuration. There's your two resistors for your feedback. It'll tell you how to set the gain. V plus supply, V minus supply, and then your output. And then it'll show you, wow, what did I do? It'll show you like what the chip actually looks like. This is what you're actually gonna see. Like it's gonna be a little dip eight uh, chip. Looks like this, okay? So those, that's showing you, you see this little tab right here? That's that little tab right there. So you know which pin's pin one and then it tells you, okay, so, I got so much crap open. It tells you offset, all these pins, NC means no connect, that means don't connect it anywhere. V plus and V minus, those are your power supply rails, your inverting and your non-inverting input, those are your plus and minus inputs. Output is here. So all these things, and then the, it'll also tell you what each pin is. And then if you go down to absolute maximum ratings, it says supply voltage. You cannot power it with more than plus or minus 22 volts if you have this version of the chip. You can't power it with more than plus or minus 18 volts if you have this version of the chip. This is going to be really practical when you do the 221 lab and when you do any projects that you do. The data sheet is the most important thing you have because it tells you everything you need to know about the chip. It'll tell you what kind of gains you can set. It'll tell you at what frequencies the op amp will work. Because op amps don't only amplify DC voltage, they also amplify AC voltage. So if I have a gain of two and I pass in a one volt amplitude sine wave, it'll output a two volt amplitude sine wave. But they have frequency limitations. You can't go up to like gigahertz unless you design some super op amp. And this is why I'm saying to be careful uh, between ideal op amps like this and non-ideal op amps like this because if you use an ideal op amp it will give you all this great ideal behavior where a non-ideal op amp won't okay and so here's another thing when you design these op amps people design these they're trying to design this what i what i call the open loop gain to be enormous because the more the bigger the open loop gain the better the op amp will perform if i make this more reasonable like 1e6 what you'll notice is now it's negative 13.99. It didn't converge to negative 14. That's a more realistic op amp because a realistic op amp has an open loop gain of a million, not of 10 kajillion or whatever I just put in there, right? So these are all practical things. Uh, this is called the non. This is called the inverting topology. That's when the input and the output flip, basically polarity. And again, it's the ratio that matters. So if I make these both 7k the gain is still one, because it's R2 over R1. It doesn't matter what their values are. It's the ratio. So again, my output's negative two here. Yeah? So could you use an op amp to actually step down the voltage? So in this case, if you put 14 and R1 on R2, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So now it's a smaller value. Oh, okay. And so when we, when we boost a signal up, that's called amplifying. Mm -hmm. When we cut a signal down, that's called attenuating. So if you ever hear, oh, it's attenuating, it's attenuating, people will say that all the time and not even ever tell you what it means. <laughs> attenuating is the opposite of amplifying. If I pass in a one volt signal, I get a half a volt out, that's attenuating. If I pass in, a phone call. If I pass in a one volt signal, it boosts up to two, that's amplifying. All right? Uh, No, you can still use an op amp. Oh, okay. I just did it. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you could do that, like in in real life. In real practice. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, yeah, because when you so so op amps also, you know, how I showed you guys frequency response where we're looking at this range of frequencies. Op amps have a frequency response too. Hey, let's go look at my webpage. I have a I did an op amp project. Uh, if you take Baker's 420, you'll also do an op amp project. Um, why do you guys laugh every time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, low voltage, high gain op amp. Okay, so so we actually designed an op amp. It, it's insane. What's inside of an op amp is insane. All right, but this is like the summary of my op amp. Uh, it talks about different loads that it can drive, what the power supply voltages were, what frequency can it run at, all these metrics that you, you shouldn't know anything about and don't worry about yet. Um, so inside the op amp, this is all this is all stuff that's inside. This is like the actual op amp. 
these are all transistors doing different things. Um, talk about trade-offs. Uh, I want to show you the frequency response, though. So this is the frequency response. Okay, I talked about dBs, how it's like a unitless kind of thing. It's the ratio of the output to the input. This is showing you that my op amp can operate at these really low frequencies and all of these values for gain out to these frequencies. This is like the maximum gain that I could get. Every uh, jump in 60 dB, I think, is a factor of 1,000. So if I went to 120 dB, that'd be a million because it's 1,000 times 1,000. But yeah, all these plots are telling you an FUN, it's unity gain frequency, that's the highest frequency I can go to with a gain of one. So even at, low, at higher frequencies, I could get a gain of less than one. Are you laughing at the FUN? No, because I said fun. <laughs> yeah, Baker, Baker says it, fun. He always, he, he, he had it as just FU. <laughs> and he changed it, he changed it to FUN. Better. Even it's better, but it still <laughs> still causes problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah, <laughs> so so inside this op amp, basically, because I you in in LT Spice you can make a circuit and then make a symbol for the circuit. This is the symbol that I made for this. So you see, I have VM VP. And V out, those are the pins. And then this thing has a VM, a VP, and a V out. All right. <coughs> oh, for using the, the transistors? Yeah. Well, you don't need to do this until you take 420. Yeah, yeah, it'll be useful. Uh, all right, well, I don't have anything else unless we only have two minutes, so. Yeah. Yeah, I hope. <laughs> if they're shifting rooms, I don't know about it. Okay. So hopefully, I mean, I'm planning on coming here. All right. If we get kicked out of here, I guess we'll have to find somewhere else to go.